Remote work is not a COVID era invention. It has been evolving for decades. But the COVID era forced many companies to adopt a remote work with little preparation. And today, the debate rages inside companies. Do we bring people back to the office? Do we continue with remote work? Is there a workable middle ground? Anbib has spent the better part of the last decade advising companies on remote work strategies, and this week, she joins NextNQ to discuss how remote work tools can contribute to mental health issues, how work from home has impacted productivity, keys to leading a remote workforce, the two things employees really want, the most important considerations before outsourcing or hiring offshore, what fractional workers are and why you might want them, and the future of remote work. Let's get to it. Welcome to Next in Q, the podcast for contact center and customer experience professionals. Next in Q is brought to you by Happy To, your service team's personal coach, giving them the process, resources, and insights to deliver the perfect customer experience over the phone. Learn more at happitu.com. Now, here's your host, Rob Dwyer. Hey, everyone. Thanks for joining another episode of Next in Q. You know who I am. I'm Rob DeWire. And today, joining me, Ann Bibb. Hi, Ann. How are you? I'm good. Thank you. I thank you so much for having me today. I am very excited. I know we're going to have a, a fun conversation talking about uh, the direction, the future, the evolution of remote work. Uh, and I know that that is a topic that is kind of really hot out there. But before we get into all of that. Uh, tell us a little bit about you. Where are you from? Uh, and kind of how did you get to what you're doing today? You know, it's kind of funny that you say the evolution of remote work, because the name of my company is Remote Evolution. So uh, I am the founder and CEO of Remote Evolution, which is a consultant and advisory firm that I help organizations to expand geographically to different countries. We've helped organizations move into more than 20 countries. I think that we're actually pushing that uh, above 30 number now. We, we wow. need to sit down and, and relook at those numbers. And then when we help them get into those countries, whether it's through acquisition or partnerships or uh, site selection, once we do that, we ask them and, you know, we partner with them on the, the hiring for the new employees. And we try and do that through impact sourcing. So impact sourcing, for those of you who don't know, is trying to help marginalized communities, um, helping refugees, helping uh, LGBTQ, people of color, women, um, organiz or people that need the, the jobs. So we'll also partner with universities and, and things along those lines, helping lift people up out of poverty and move into the next generation of leaders. So that's what our goal is as we look and move into these new geographies. Now, moving into geographies also means helping countries, helping people from other countries move into the United States and partner with the U.S. So that also includes impact sourcing in the United States. So we're very excited about what the future holds for us in that in that way. I love that. I love that. So when did you first get exposed to remote work or work from home, work from anywhere, whatever you want to call it? You know, as much as I love this question, this question seriously dates me. <laughs> <laughs> I was exposed to remote work in the 90s. Um, so I was when you were 12, I think. Yes, right? absolutely. Absolutely. I was just a young <laughs> babe at that point. Um, so I was working for a company called WorldCom, um, which many people don't remember. 
but it eventually purchased a company called MCI and became MCI Worldcom. And I was commuting a good hour, hour and 15 minutes. And I was a, a young mother at that time. And my boss told me one day, he said, you have a laptop? And I said, yes, you, you know, it's right here. Hello, it's yours. And he said, you have internet at home? And I said, well, yes. And he said, why don't you work from home? And I said, what? <laughs> what, is, what does that mean? And of course, these laptops back then, they were gigantic, like, you know, an inch and a half, two inches thick, right? <laughs> Uh, you know, probably weighed as much as my baby did back then. Um, but once I was, once I started, man, I was hooked. Uh, I would end up working from home a few days a week. I would only come in as necessary. And uh, that little bit of taste of remote work, of working from home, I was, I was done. I, at that moment, knew that that was the wave of the future. Yeah, it amazes me that people think that working from home is this brand new thing brought on by COVID. And, and it was for certain industries, right? There are a lot of industries that had never uh, even tried that before, companies that had never tried it, uh, and they, they had their hand forced. But work from home is, is not a new concept. It's been going on for decades, and it can be really effective. And it has evolved over time. Uh, I was just talking to someone the other day and I, I was laughing because someone asked me once why I didn't name, or they asked me during the pandemic, why didn't you name your company Remote Revolution? Because this is the remote, this is the revolution of remote work. And <laughs> I said, well, first of all, because my company was started well beyond, before the pandemic. And secondly, why would I name my company for basically what you're talking about is a pinpoint in time for what is happening with remote work when in fact it is actually an evolution of what is happening because as you just pointed out, remote work has been here for decades, decades. I mean, there's a whole generation of people that have been born and grown <laughs> up and graduated from college. And remote work started before them. Yeah. That's mind boggling. It absolutely is. And I think, right, a lot of people are just now being exposed to this. And certainly technology has made it easier as time has gone on and we've come up with new tools and more complicated <laughs> and more complicated. You're absolutely right. So I want to talk about that because so we are seeing a whole suite of new tools, right? The internet has made communication uh, as easy. Here we are, you and I are on video using Zoom. And uh, that's not something that you could have effectively done once upon a time when the internet wasn't as fast as it is today. But let's talk about what's gotten more complicated. Well, in order to talk to you over Zoom, we have to have that internet connection, right? Not everybody does. Also, you have to have a stable internet connection. And let's talk about the mental health impact of actually looking at yourself all day long. I, I had to remove uh, my self view to have this conversation. I don't want to be looking at this. I'm sorry. No, thank you. Pass. Because your brain is not meant to be looking at yourself for that amount of time. It really messes not just with your brain, but with your psyche and your mental health. We also shouldn't be looking at the computer screen like this and having these conversations. So yes, let's, let's go back to the fact that I started remote working and working from home a long, let's just say a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, I think that's fair. Um, but we didn't have, we weren't using Zoom. We weren't using these video chats. 
we would hop on a bridge, right? Right. Okay, you want to, your bridge or mine, right? And we would be on a conference call and we wouldn't be seeing each other, but we would hear each other and we could have 15, 20 people on a conference call. So a lot of things have advanced. But what's interesting is to see what's happened since all of this technology has advanced and the mental health impact from the visual nature and the stimulation that's happened to the brain. Because everybody, not everybody, that's an overgeneralization. So many people who are used to being in an office and have the need to see in order to think, if I see it, it's happening. If I see them, they're working. I have to see it or it's not real. Those individuals are the ones that need that that visual conversation. Whereas many of us are just like, oh, we can work asynchronously. We can chat about it. We can hop on a quick phone call. We can do a quick huddle. The the actual hearing of it is fine or the reading of it is fine. We don't need the visual. It's that visual that is causing a lot of the issues. Yeah. It's interesting to me that in, in the growth of the technology, which allows us to do exactly what we're doing right now, that it does hinder people. And there, there is like zoom fatigue is real and, it is. and you may not be using zoom, but absolutely. If you are someone who is in back-to-back-to-back meetings on a regular basis and you're having to see yourself, like I get why people want to shut their camera off because like sometimes you just don't want everybody looking at your every move. Exactly. And then you start talking about the lack of training on how to time block your days so that you're not in those back-to-back meetings. And then this is where I think it really started to go south. And I'm interested to, you know, hear your perspective on this as well. Because people weren't in the office, and again, out of sight, out of mind, they feel like if they can't see them, it's not working, it's not happening. All of a sudden, all of these additional tools started popping up on how to monitor performance, how to make sure that, you know, mouses weren't being still, uh, the little keystrokes were still happening. Webcams were monitoring people and could see them while they were working, even when they weren't on a call. Like talk about invasive. It just, it it went, it, to me, it, it went way too far. Yeah. I think there's a focus on productivity. Uh, There's a couple of things, right? So number one, uh, I, I just read, uh, had an interaction, let's say on LinkedIn, um, someone posted that productivity in the U S workforce has decreased over the last, I don't know, quarter. And there was some speculation that work from home was one of the drivers to that. And I think there is, we get focused or, or we want to see one cause for any given thing, right? We want it to be easy. We want we want to understand why this is happening so we can fix it, right? Productivity is down. Well, what's changed? Well, more people work from home. So that must be the reason. When there are all kinds of other things going on, and that equation is not that simple, right? Um And then I think you also see that there are people in the world, I mean, as we're recording this today, uh, I think the biggest thing in in, mm, the news of social media, let's say, is what's happening at Twitter, right? So the new owner slash CEO has come in and said, no more work from home. Everybody come back to the office. And if you don't want to do that, then see you later. But I think that's driven by a belief. And that belief is, if I can't see you producing, then I don't believe you're producing. And that's what's led to these alternate methods of us measuring production. In a call center environment, it's pretty easy, right? We've had these tools and we measure a lot of things. When you're talking about knowledge workers, there is a 
there's this concern that people are slacking off. And you know what? Some people probably are, but the vast majority of people are not. And I think that it's not only creepy to have those things monitored, but it's really so much more when it's entering your home. Because your home is your personal, personal space. 100%. But I think that you mentioned that there are a couple of things to take into consideration. And I find it fascinating that at the beginning of the pandemic, the message was people working from home were X times more productive, right? Three years later, it's, they're X times less productive. Oh, and by the way, the whole world is, is suffering from burnout and a mental health crisis and, you know, all of these other things. Well, look at the message of how these two things are going together. Because what has happened is over the last two and a half, three years, yes, at the beginning, people were more productive because these individuals were not, one, taught how to work from home, how to manage their time, and how to separate work life from home life in the same space. Two, leaders, and this is a big one, this is huge, leaders were not taught how to manage remotely. And there is a huge difference between leading and managing remotely, and those are two different things, leading remotely and managing remotely. They were not taught how to do that. And that is a very different thing from leading and managing in an office. So all of these leaders and managers who were doing it very successfully in a brick and mortar or in an office building, all of a sudden were tossed into this environment, which I have said it a hundred million times and I will continue to say it. This was not work from home. This was not remote work. This was people working from home during a crisis, during a pandemic. Not the same thing. This is why even people that have been working from home for many years also suffered because they were in a situation that they could not leave their house. They could not do what they would do on a regular basis. So all of a sudden they're they're outside of their comfort zone and they're trying to manage their mental health, their well-being, and figure out how to live their lives. So you've got leaders who don't know how to lead, leading people who don't know how to work in an environment that they don't know how to do this in. And oh by by the way, this is their home also. So they don't know how to separate the two. So what happens is they just figure out how to do it. They never leave. So they're more productive because they're just continuing to do it, which eventually burns them the heck out. So we are suffering from two and a half years of leaders not recognizing the sign and encouraging people to step away from work and take that time away. Yeah. And then people are now like, I, this is not my job. I need to step away. Give me my space. I am only going to the, to do the job and work the hours that I was hired to do because I am, I'm done. I'm burned out. So that's where we are. And so they're taking this, they're taking this message of productivity and saying people are less productive when in reality, People are saying, it's not that I'm less productive. I am just going to be as productive as I'm supposed to be. Yeah, you bring up some incredibly salient points and some that I want to dig into a little bit deeper. Um, The first one that I want to talk about is the difference between working from home during a crisis and actually having a strategy that allows remote work. And what's different about those two? Obviously, right, uh, when we were in the the midst of the early days of the pandemic, I think we all felt a little trapped. That is not really the case anymore, depending on where you live. But I think there are a lot of 
companies that are still using the exact same model that they were using in March or April of 2020 for work from home. And that's probably why they're struggling. So can you talk more about what we need to do as an organization if we really want to make remote work a part of our model? So there are a couple of things. I think it's important to ensure that you understand remote work. What is that definition for your organization? I've heard companies say that um, we're remote first. We're a remote first organization. And then you go through the interview process for a remote position to find out it's actually a hybrid position. And they say, well, we're remote first because we, we said that you can work remotely. So of course we're remote first. That's not, you know what? That's not remote first. Um, so I think it's incredibly important for every organization to sit down and do a couple of things. One, define what their strategy is from the ground up of what do their employees want, right? Oh my gosh, what a concept. Have you actually even talked to your employees? Do you know what they want? Or have you just mandated from the top, this is what it's going to be? Like somebody that we we, we know at Twitter <laughs> that has just recently said, uh, everybody, or I think he did it at, at Tesla too, you're can. Oh, yeah, you can work from home once you've worked in the office for 40 weeks. <laughs> well, that's incentive because you know what? I was only going to work 40 hours, period. Uh, but and then, of course, we see the mandates here. I mean, my goodness, that company had 7,500 employees a month ago. And I think they're down to when I was reading. I mean, of course, take into consideration. This is we never know what, what news is real. But I was reading somewhere around 250 employees. After his layoff, additional resignation, and then his mandate that came through saying, you must agree to commit essentially your life. You know, you're going to work like forever. You're going to give everything that you have and you're going to commit everything to Twitter and um, work like a dog. And those who aren't willing to commit this, you know, you can resign and I'll give you a severance package. Well, I'll take a severance package. I'm not going to commit to that. I, I've been there, done that. I'm not doing it anymore. And so now he's down to 250 employees or somewhere around there. And the whole company is going to come crashing down. That was well spent $44 billion, sir. <laughs> I mean, it, it just is absolutely insane what is happening there. But it comes down to what, what, what did the employees want? I mean, I, I get that there's a business need and you absolutely have to marry your business needs with what your employees need. Are they going to match up? No, they're absolutely not. But how close can you get? How close can you get? Mm. His employees want to continue working remotely. Can they continue working remotely and you manage performance and you get stuff done in order to keep the business moving where it needs to go. I'm sure that with the majority of them or a good 75% of them, you could have done that instead of just putting your foot down and saying, Oh no, I'm the big bad boss. And I'm going to force everybody back into the office because I'm the one that has the money and I can, what I say, go. It's just, you have to take care of your employees. If you don't take care of your employees, you're either going to lose them or they're going to rebel and they're going to cause a negative customer experience and your customers are going to leave. This is just a lose-lose situation if you don't take care of your employees. Yeah, and it's amazing to me that, right, people think it's it's one or the other and it doesn't have to be That's not. because some employees are going to prefer to be in the office if they have that as an option. Or 100%. I want to come into the office a couple of days a week or three days a week, but I want to be able to work at home on other days. And that may be um, just because I don't want to deal with the commute. It may be because I have childcare issues, right? I want to be there 
when the bus drops off my kid for that 15 minutes, right? And then get back to work. And, and I can't do that if I'm in the office. There are just a, there are a wide variety of we- reasons that people want to do one or the other. And I think I understanding- you Brace your- yourself here, Rob. Uh-oh, brace yourself. Uh-oh. I have two things that employees want. Flexibility. The, the second one is the big one. Choice. <gasps> <laughs> they want choice. Yeah. They want to choose when they want to be in the office, when they want to be at home. They want to choose. I would choose not to be in the office most of the time. You are choosing to be in the office because that's where you are most successful. That's your choice. You should have that choice. Yeah, it just seems like, and again, right? Some companies are, it's great that they can do a hundred percent remote work or or maybe their business doesn't allow for that, right? I mean, obviously if you're running a grocery store, oh, that's wow. gonna make it really hard for, for you to have people work from home. But in those businesses where I can manage both, there certainly can be a huge advantage to adopting that hybrid model and can actually drive people to want to work for you and, and can be a talent attractor. 100%. And I think before all of the haters come after me, because they do, I, <laughs> you know, I, I tend to attract those. I think it's really important to make sure that everybody understands while I am an advocate for employee choice, I am an advocate for employee experience for remote work, for hybrid work. I also am very clear that it is not one size fits all. There are jobs, there are companies that this does not work for. And that's okay because you know what? Employees that are going after those jobs generally know and understand what they're getting into. It's the jobs that are, that do have the flexibility for this type of hybrid or remote work situation. Those are the ones that we're having the conversations about. You know, grocery workers, inventory stockers, um, doctors that are in hospitals, people doing surgery, uh, janitorial staff that are cleaning the buildings. We understand those are not the positions that we're having conversations about. Those People understand when they're applying for those jobs, those are on site. They ha- you have to get up and physically go to work to go to that job. Not what we're talking about. We're talking specifically about positions that can be done from any location and whether the company has taken into consideration where the employee is going to be most successful doing that job. Yeah, absolutely. 100%. So let's talk about then the the leadership. Because one of the things that you mentioned that is a stumbling block for a lot of companies is we're, you know, work from home or remote work, but the leadership hasn't been trained on how they need to do things differently in that environment versus an environment where everyone is in the same place. So what are some of the kind of foundational things that leaders need to learn to do differently when their team is is not all in the same location? Oh, my goodness. There's so much here. First off, recognizing the signs. Um, I'm going to use you as an example, Rob. If we work together day in and day out, and I see you coming in and messaging in the chat room, you're very active. That's what I should see every day. If all of a sudden I see you logging on, but just saying hi, and then that is it, that is a flag. I should be checking on you recognizing and knowing the signs of change and knowing when to check on individuals is a huge remote leadership area of opportunity that people have not grasped onto. Secondly, communication in general. This is a huge area of opportunity. People, what has happened 
over the last couple of years is that people have just continued to only talk work and they have lost the ability to just say, Hey Rob, you know, I know this is our one-on-one, -on -one, but I just wanted to check in and see how you're doing. I wanted to get to know Rob. How's everything? How's the family? What are you doing for Thanksgiving? You know, oh, you've got a new dog. Oh, do you have any pictures you want to share? What's happening? Are you going anywhere? Like how, get to know your people. You know what? Your team, they are humans. They are people too, just like you. And that is something that leaders seem to have forgotten in this course of separation. And I go back to out of sight, out of mind. And they've compartmentalized that uh, that whole situation and where they've all of a sudden just have this this me feeling and they just have completely forgotten about the human aspect of leadership when their team is not in front of them. So, you know, that communication piece, engagement, getting to know and engage with their team is a big piece of it. And then learning how to performance manage remotely. It isn't all that different, but it is. Because when you're performance managing somebody in a remote environment, you have to remember that when they leave and they get off of this chat with you, if I'm sitting here telling you, Rob, that you're not doing great, you slipped in your numbers, and you really need to improve so that we don't put you on some sort of performance improvement plan, I have to recognize that as soon as we get off of this call, you are alone. You are absolutely alone in that office. And you're going to dwell on that. So doing that coaching from a remote perspective takes a different type of empathy, a different type of coaching, just a different touch. And then following up and watching the behavior and making sure that that individual just doesn't go off rails. Because you know what, we don't know. As much as I'm gonna try and get to know Rob as an individual, Rob is only gonna show me what Rob wants me to see. He's gonna show me the Facebook life of Rob, right? Yeah. He's gonna show me the pictures, the happy and all of that. I'm never going to see the, I fought with my spouse last night, everything's breaking, my washer and dryer, went out, I, you know, I'm at $50,000 in debt because my kids have done this and everything's breaking and my whole world is falling apart. I'm going to show you everything's rosy and rainbows and puppy dog tails. But now you're telling me that I'm almost on a pip, which is going to make me feel like I'm going to lose my job and I'm going to spiral out of control. And it's just one more thing on my already broken and almost shattered plate. And I'm just, from a mental health perspective, in shambles. And now I'm alone in this room. And you want me to do better on these calls? Mm -hmm. You want me to do, you want me to sound happy? You want me to do better and take care of these customers? So remote work coaching is different. Remote work performance management is different. You have to recognize what's happening on the other end. And you have to take care of the human as much as you take care of the customer. Yeah, I think one of the things that you just touched on so deeply that we forget is that in that environment versus an office environment, I don't have the same type of peer support group that I would otherwise have. And that impacts both of that situation, right? Where I just need to, maybe I need to let a little steam off and, and just have somebody listen to me. But it also can um, impact my ability to learn from my peers if you don't have things set up to facilitate that, right? A lot of what you learn is by just what you hear um, and, and how other people are working and what they're doing to be successful. And in a remote environment, I can be very siloed 
and not get the advantage of either of those things. And what I hear you saying is we just need to be better because what we used to be able to do was take advantage of the fact that there was peer support as a leader. And I didn't have to be as intentional with my coaching and my leadership and my mentorship because I could rely on that peer support group to help bring that person back from wherever it was. And now it's on me as a leader. So I have to be better as a leader. You nailed it. Intentional with purpose, cognizant leading, not coasting. The other thing that you talked about, and again, it goes back to just being more intentional is how I get to know my people on a personal level to build that relationship and that trust. It used to be if I was working in a brick and mortar environment, an office environment that I could, I could lead by walking around. And then we would have those you know, water cooler conversations, even if it wasn't a water cooler. Maybe we talk about what we watched on TV last night or the game over the weekend or, you know, the kids, what they dressed up for, for Halloween, right? All of those things that are just these little in passing conversations that we could have without thinking about it. In a remote world, I have to be intentional about making time for those. It requires more effort and more forethought to make it happen. But that's still important as a leader to make those things happen. Absolutely. 100%. So if I'm thrust into this work from home, and my let let's say I'm a, a front level leader, right? Either front line or maybe or maybe the next level up in my leadership group. But my my organization maybe isn't trending in the right direction from from supporting everything that we need. What are some of the things that just I can do? I, that I can just say, you know what? I know it's not great, it's not perfect here, but what can I do to make this situation work better for people? So I am a big, a really large component with regard to self-learning, right? So there are a lot of, um, a lot of courses out there, especially on LinkedIn. Um, there are other courses out there that are helping you as an individual learn how to be better in this area. Um, there are also there are also coaches. Be careful because during the pandemic, <laughs> a lot of individuals came out of the walls and the creeks and the uh, all the floors that all of a sudden were uh, subject matter experts in this area. So um, do your due diligence, do your research, make sure that you are talking to somebody that has been in this area for a long time, well before the pandemic. Um, but there are many of us out here who have uh, a lot of experience in many different departments um, with remote work, with hybrid work, on helping organizations put strategies in place, on helping individuals to take things to their companies, uh, to help them understand the need. Um, I've talked to organizations with regard to specific trainings and what trainings are needed. Uh, so there are a lot of things that you as an individual can do, uh, even if it is individual learning or helping somebody come in and introduce them to your leadership as a, I think this person can help our organization with the future of where we're going. So there's kind of two ways that you can go about it from an individual and an organizational standpoint. Mm, yeah. Great. Uh, I want to shift gears a little bit and I want to talk about one of the things that remote work 
allows for, and that is the ability to expand my team outside of my country. So, you know, most of my listeners are are in the U S not all of them, but obviously um, you can now outsource uh, um, a lot of different functions to a lot of different countries. What are some of the considerations that I need to have as an organization if I've never outsourced anything, uh, particularly offshore, but I'm considering that, what do I need to be thinking about other than how much money is going to save me? (laughs) Well, there are a few things to look at. Um, One, do you want to outsource Or do you just want to hire somebody that is working in a different country, which is also going to save you money, right? Um, Either way is possible. If you want to hire somebody that is going to have a lower, uh, a lower salary because they're in a different country, um, but you, you know, there's also some considerations to take into place. Um, Do you have the right to hire them in that country? Or do you need to go through what's called an EOR, which is called an employer of record? So a couple of different things to look at there. Um, A lot of times companies don't know which way to go. They'll hire somebody like me or another consultant that will help them navigate these waters to figure out which country is best for them, so on and so forth. Sometimes they have an employee that, I have, they originally hired in the U.S. that wants to move to Thailand or wants to move to someplace. And they're like, we want to accommodate this from an employee experience. How do we do this? Because we don't have an entity here, but we want our employee to be happy. So we, again, help them navigate these waters to figure out how we can do that. Anything's possible. It's just figuring it out. Now, if they choose to outsource, there are a lot of things to take into consideration. Again, going back to what is it that you are trying to accomplish? Are you trying to uh, do customer service? Are you needing IT support? Are you wanting voice work? Are you wanting non-voice work? What exactly are you looking to outsource in order to, uh, that's the first thing to narrow down. Then it's looking at what is your budget? Um, because I, and I don't start with budget because, you know, you got to know what you're looking, what is it you want before you look at the budget? Um, there are so many, I mean, outsourcing is a $500 billion industry. There are thousands of outsourcers. That is overwhelming. It is. You know, and you can go at it by yourself. But what I have found to be the easiest is to do an RFP or an RFI, depending on the scope of what you're looking for. Um, And many times, again, that's overwhelming, especially for first timers. So they'll go through an organization that has done it a hundred times and will help them navigate those waters. There are several organizations like myself that can sit down and say, Rob, let's talk about what it is that you want to accomplish. All right, so now we know who you want, what you need. Let's talk about what your KPIs are. What is your customer experience like? Let's work through all of these things, and then we're going to put this RFP together, and we're going to send it out to everybody that we think is going to be a good fit for you. Then we're going to get it back, and we're going to sit down with you, and we're going to talk about who we think, uh, you know, and you're going to make the decision, we're going to sit there and help you wade through it. So we basically help you navigate those waters, but you have to figure, the hardest part for you is figuring out what you need and what you can spend. Those are, those are really big decisions because let's face it, it's a, it's an expensive world right now. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, a lot of people think of outsourcing. They do think of, uh, customer care, tech support, the phone work, right? They think of their their customer service department. Uh, but There's you so touched on 
There are a lot of other things that you could consider outsourcing. What are some of the other functions out there that people are, are outsourcing? I have been in a situation where literally the only people that actually worked in an organization were the C-suite and everything else in the company was outsourced. So that's wild. It's wild that there have been project managers, coders, engineers, um, you know, content moderators, social media managers, uh, marketing, a marketing team, an entire marketing team. Uh, so think about anybody in your company can be outsourced. It's just a matter of what what is it that you need accomplished? Do you need somebody full time? Do you need somebody full time on your staff? As a startup, the likelihood is that you don't need somebody full time. You might just need a fractional person. The fractional business is hot, hot, hot right now. There are fractional CEOs, CMOs, CFOs, COOs, um, not to mention, you know, just fractional sales teams. If you need BDRs, oh my goodness, I can get you a BDRs out the wahoo. Uh, so whatever you need, there is somebody that has the ability to outsource that. So let's let's define this for people that aren't familiar with this term, but a, a fractional worker. Tell us exactly what that means. So fractional is kind of like part time, but when you're talking about an executive. It's fancy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's a fancy part time. Like right? fancy I mean, part time. I think that's it, a perfect way to put it. You're, you're spot on there. I it's mean, if I'm a fractional CXO, then I'm assigned to company X for half of the time and half of the time to company, you know, Z. And I work on their accounts fifty percent of the time each. That's exactly what a fractional is. So part-time here, part-time there. Yeah. Yeah. I think anyone who has been involved in, in consulting can understand that, or, or maybe even if you've been involved in some type of outsourcing, right? You might support mm -hmm. multiple clients and uh, it's a very similar concept, but you can for your organization just say, Hey, we need someone to do this, but it really doesn't justify full time. Let's see if we can find someone to fractionally fill in because that, that's all we need right now. And that can be a really cost effective way to fill a role and uh, you can grow from there, right? Later, it and might become full time. Another way to think of it is um, like gig work, mm -hmm. which also incredibly hot right now. Um, people like the flexibility that is coming with gig work because they can work when they want to work. They can work when they feel like it's busy and they're going to make money. But if it's not busy and they're like, I'm just sitting here, I'm not making money. So I'm going to hop off and I'm going to go do what I want to do. I'm going to go take my kids to a movie or I'm going to go do laundry or I'm going to go do what I need to accomplish to make my life work. And then I'm going to come back and work when I'm actually going to make yeah, absolutely. So let's talk about the future, right? I mean, we've talked about uh, the not all that distant past when Anne started working at home. It wasn't that long ago. I think we firmly <laughs> established it wasn't that long ago. <laughs> um, we've talked about the very recent past, right? When COVID hit and everybody just kind of went home. We've talked about really the the present and kind of some of the struggles, but let's, let's open that crystal ball up or, or take the, take the cloth off of it. And let's talk about what the future looks like as it relates to remote work. What do you think is going to change? What do you think is going to stay the same? What problems will we solve and what problems will we still be struggling with, you know, three, four or five years down the road? You know, that, that is such an interesting question. 
because until until organizations and specifically leaders start really thinking about EX and start thinking about what do I need to take care of my employees? I don't think that we're really going to see the evolution that we need to with regard to whether it is remote, work from anywhere, remote first, hybrid, brick and mortar. There are some that have really thought about it, but overall, that needs to change. Um, and quite honestly, I think we need to see a shift in generational work. Um, we need to see a dropout of a specific generation dropping out of the C-suite and a new generation stepping into it mm. in order for that mindset shift to happen. So we're starting to see a little bit of that, but I think it's going to be a few more years before it really takes hold. Gen Z has really, really surprised me. Like, they're the definition of, um, you know, just stick around and find out because you just don't mess with them. And I love it. I absolutely do. Um, and I'm watching what's happening with this generation as they're coming into the workplace and they're saying, no, this is, this is what we need in order to take care of the customers or this is what we need as an employee. Give me this as an employee and I will do my job and I will do it well. I am so amazingly impressed by them and I'm looking forward to seeing what they do as they move into leadership positions because I think that that is going to be a huge shift in overall experience. So not just employee experience, but total experience from, from employee, customer, omni, multi-user, just human experience in general. Yeah, it seems like Right, the generation that is communicating uh, virally through TikTok is going to look at things differently yeah. than a generation who maybe didn't even grow up with computers, right? I mean, and they're making a lot of decisions about companies. Yeah, yeah. There's, uh, I, I think, right. The questions are always the same when it comes to business it's the answers that change. And sometimes you need just people with different perspective to come in and provide those new answers, right? How do we, how do we provide a better service? How do we uh, treat our employees better? How do we make our customers and our employee employees happier? Those are, those are questions people have been asking really for a long, long time. It's the answers that are changing. And sometimes you just need a different perspective to come up with the right answer for now. It's interesting because I think that these, I think a lot of existing leaders recognize that as your business grows, that you, you have to change how you run your business from a CX standpoint. For instance, as you move from startup to mid-market, you can't run your operations the same. You can't run your CS team the same. You can't run your sales team the same. Like they get this. They know this. They know that there are certain like milestones in business that you have to change. And if you don't, then you're going to plateau and you're not going to continue to grow. They understand this from a logical and a business perspective. Yet there are so many larger companies that they've, they made it. Like, this is great. You know, we're, we're big. Like, we don't have to make this pivot as anymore. But you do. Time is still a mile marker and still requires the pivot and how you run your organization from an employee experience perspective. And I think that that's, 
that's the thing that's being missed is yes, you know, you, from a size perspective, you are, you know, you, you hit, you pivoted, you keep winning. Time still keeps moving. Generations still keep changing. Pivots still need to continue. And that's the mess that's happening right now. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it has been so much fun talking with you today. And I can't thank you enough for joining me on Next Thank You and, and sharing your expertise. Uh, if someone is out there and they're like, hey, uh, we're trying to deal with uh, some of these things that you've been talking about and we're struggling, maybe, maybe they want to talk with you. What's the best way for them to get in touch with you? So I'm going to give you three ways to get in touch with me. The first, you can always reach me on LinkedIn. Uh, you can find me at Andid, A-N-N-E-D-I-B-B, on LinkedIn. The second, our website for our organization is remoteevolution.com. And then I do a lot of speaking engagements, a lot of podcasts. We have our own podcast launching in Q1 of next year. And we will be at andbib.com. And again, that's A-N-N-E-B-I-B-B.com. Fantastic. We'll make sure all of that is in the show notes so people will have those links available again. And I can't thank you enough for joining. I really appreciate your time and uh, look forward to speaking with you in the future. Absolutely. Thanks for having me, Rob. Next in Q is brought to you by Happy To and is produced by me, Rob Dwyer. If you enjoy this podcast, please, by all means, subscribe and or rate this podcast in iTunes or your favorite podcast app. But more importantly, please tell just one person about this podcast. Word of mouth is the best way for people to discover new content. As always, thanks for listening.